Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi. Very exciting today. Uh, the guest, our guest is Suzanne Axelson. I almost did it. We were practicing <laughs> before we recorded uh, to make sure I was saying her name wrong, and I almost uh, said it the wrong way uh, to make sure I was saying it right. Anyway, welcome, Suzanne. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you for me. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself here in a minute, but we're going to start, uh, we're going to have a conversation about this book that came out in the last year, uh, which I loved for multiple reasons. One, because of the excellent early childhood content, but also all of the weaving analogies and metaphors. Um, I'm sort of a little bit of a weaver, so that was an interesting context. But the book is called The Original Learning Approach, Weaving Together Playing, Learning, and Teaching in Early Childhood. So welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, what do you want uh, folks to know about you? Well, based in Sweden, so despite writing the book in American English, which was a challenge for me because I'm originally British. Yeah. So um, my spelling had to be constantly checked. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah. But I think that's given me this way of understanding different perspectives, uh -huh. having come from one culture, coming into another culture and learning and trying work at how to make the best part of everything yeah. come to the front yeah and, and you just did a book in Swedish too then right yes. oh yes, my I goodness <laughs> <laughs> which I never thought I was ever being able to write a book in Swedish but I did uh -huh. That's which nice. actually it's um working on just one of the threads from the original uh -huh. learning approach so oh, okay. I focus on risk uh -huh. on the risk thread and uh, but weave in how the other threads impact that so it's much more about risky play uh -huh. also risk in education and social risks and emotional risks so oh that yeah. sounds interesting I don't read Swedish <laughs> <laughs> um I could probably find someone I grew up in a tiny tiny rural town that was we claimed to be the Swede capital Swedish capital of Nebraska so I could probably find someone back home who could help me with it um at any rate thank you for being here I'm so thrilled uh this is really nice to have you here we're going to start with a quote um well, let me say this first. There's really three things I'd really love to hear you talking about, um, but we'll go as we go. But one is the ethics of play that you discuss, and then you introduce a couple of terms, the play ecosystem and play responsive, um, that I think, um, I mean, it was really hard to go through all my highlights the other day and see <laughs> what, what we could maybe focus on. Um, but those were the three that jumped out for me. So the quote to start things and this is in your in your book, it's on page 34, and you say, put simply, children are not given the permission to play that they have a right to. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then maybe we can, we can, you can talk about play ethics or the ethics of this yeah. conversation. I think there are a lot of play or children engage in play and it gets labeled as behavior and therefore mm -hmm. needs to be corrected. And then there's a lot of play types that pe uh, that adults think is uh, too loud or it's uh, too risky and too dangerous. And all of these different labels get attached to it and, and the children get stopped. Mm -hmm. So they don't get a full repertoire. And I think, of course, some play we do have to intervene and stop. Yeah. It is dangerous because they're still learning. But I think sometimes we were a little bit too quick mm -hmm. to come in and to... Uh, to, to forbid some play types and, and some play forms that should children really should have access to, yeah. to because I think we need all of it. <laughs> right. Uh, and I think a lot of that, at least what I see, it comes from some, some teachers feel like to be a good teacher means I always have things in control. Yeah. And some of that play looks out of control or feels out of control. Yeah. And, and I mean, there is, I think there is a sincere concern for safety, but it's, it's sort of a, a misguided concern. I think we need to have uh, balanced risk assessments uh -huh. where we're not just looking at um, what are the dangers, but we're trying to see what is the play value uh -huh. and what are the benefits. So, and then by us going through all three of these, like the, the dangers, the value and the benefits, and then making a decision about do I say no or do I need to help and intervene a little bit by giving suggestions of how to make this a bit more safe? Because the value and the benefits of this play is totally worth a scrape on the knee. Yeah. And sometimes a scrape on the knee isn't worth it. <laughs> so we, we have to really look at the, the, all of it and, and make sure it's balanced. 
Sure. I, the listeners will have heard me tell the story a lot because I've told it a lot, but there, I remember vividly one day I was working in a preschool program where I had grad students um, working with me and uh, some children were coming down the slide and a couple were trying to go up the slide. It was a wide, like two lane slide. Mm -hmm. And um, the grad students were very nervous and I just kind of moved closer to the slide, but I didn't stop it. And one of them um, you know, asked me and I was like, no, I'm gonna, let's just watch and see what happens. And we got to see so much negotiating and communicating and idea having during that couple of minutes of them navigating themselves around, around their, each other on that slide. And when we came back inside at the end of the morning, I said, you know, let's talk about what you saw. And they made this long list. And I said, which which piece of that do you wish had never happened? Like which, which, which of those experiences do you wish those children hadn't had? And um, that was a good starting point for, for me to talk about this risk benefit analysis um, that you're describing. You had three questions about play ethics here. Do we provide play because it's the right thing to do or because it is our duty or because it will make the world a better place? Is there a right answer? No, there's no right answer. <laughs> I, it's, it's a personal answer. And I think it can be a combination of those or it can be something completely different. Uh -huh. But I think what's really interesting is to start thinking about what motivates me as an adult to ensure children have play, access uh -huh. to play and have permission to play. And I think I probably, somewhere in between, it's the right thing to do and the world is a better place uh -huh. I don't think it's my duty um right. I think maybe it is a duty I don't know <laughs> <laughs> well because I was thinking about these three questions and I you know I tend to the sec the, the last two or I mean the first and the, the last the right thing to do in making the world a better place but then I wonder I feel like it's my duty then because it's un sort of under attack like it's my yeah. my duty to provide duty. yeah Maybe in, it's their duty to advocate for play yeah. rather than my duty to make sure children are playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think sometimes there are, I, I feel that some teachers are, or adults, not even just, just teachers, are, are really focusing on making sure children are playing. And therefore this is changing the way that children have permission to play. But suddenly they're being forced to play and then I think it stops being play. Uh -huh. because of this way of being you must play you must play in this way okay this, this duty takes over to ensure that everyone is playing uh -huh. and if you have a very specific adult way of seeing what play is mm -hmm. then that's going to change how you're going to provide so this is why I think it's really complicated we need to really kind of review and reflect on our own ethics of why we're providing play and uh -huh. uh, what we think play is yeah. Uh, and uh, understanding how we're enabling that uh -huh. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so, so I want to ask you a, a little bit about the definition of play. I know you talk about it in the book, but I didn't bookmark that page. So I'm just going to ask you when you, because you, you just mentioned, you know, what do we mean when we're talking about play? So what, what do you mean when you're talking about play? So for me, I ended up just choosing two words, uh -huh. which was joy and choice. Uh-huh. Um, choice because you've got to choose to participate in it you choose that you're in it and you can choose to leave it so the child has choice uh -huh. um, and joy and um, for me the opposite of joy is not being sad the opposite of joy is being pressed ah uh, so yeah. in joy you have a full range of emotions right because and I can see that being pushed back on a little bit that you know sometimes when children play they aren't showing this beautiful happiness that we think of a lot of times when we think of joy and I think when you're depressed as well, you can have a full range of emotions, but everything is just harder and heavier. Yeah. And while when you're feeling this kind of sense of joy, everything is easier. Even when you're angry, it's easier to regulate that anger. Uh -huh. And then it eventually it can spill over until you're too angry. <laughs> and, therefore, and then the anger kind of disrupts the joy part and it's, uh -huh. then it stops being played. Oh, because that's the anger brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you came on the show. Just that one piece. One one thing that was really powerful and sort of mind changing for me about about the book. Um, I mean, there was a lot that gave me a lot to think about. Um, but one thing I think you mentioned that even an adult led activity can be play if those elements of joy and choice are there. 
Yeah. Like if the child can leave that adult, and I had sort of been, I have a tendency to have a knee jerk reaction to anything that's adult led being called play. Mm. So I thought that was really I interesting. I think while it's being, I think if all of the children are choosing to be there, choosing to participate, and they also have choice to leave, um, yeah. and there's that sense of joy that everyone is feeling, then I think it can shift into a state of play. Uh -huh. um, because I don't, and I think it has to be very careful about how the adult is doing that. I think right. for the most part, when it's adult-led, it's playful. Mm -hmm. But it has the potential to shift into play. And I think some adults can play with with children as equals, as a democratic kind of space. Uh -huh. But on the whole, when when I'm doing my activities and it's shifting into play, it's usually me I'm taking steps back oh okay yeah process. so it's being taken over by the children and then it's their choices and it's their joy it's they they so I think it maybe it starts as teacher-led and then it goes in together-led uh -huh. and then maybe child-led yeah I just end. I think that's such an interesting uh addition to my thinking about you know what is play and what is the adult's role and that's often the question for so many uh people who are thinking about wanting to be more uh have spaces where children can can truly play as opposed to school like kinds mm -hmm. of early childhood settings it, a lot of times that's what they worry about is what's my role then yeah so uh, so maybe this is a good time to shift into talking about being play responsive. Yes. Um, if you want to kind of describe what that what that means. So for me, play responsive requires that the children play. They actually have their own autonomous play. Uh -huh. And that I observe this play to understand what it is that the children are learning, how they're learning it, what kind of things they're interested in, but as individuals, as a group. And then I designed that my teaching moments that I have with the children using that inspiration and that information so that it is most likely to be accepted and to be motivating <laughs> for the children. Uh -huh. um, because children are not going to learn unless they're motivated. Right. And play is where their brain is the most motivated. I mean, the whole point of play is for the brain to kind of connect with the world and make sense of the world. Uh -huh. um, so if I'm tuning into that, then I know it's going to be activating the brain in the best way and the most likely way for them to yeah. understand. So when you're talking about motivation, are you talking about uh, like intrinsic or is it something intrinsic, the adult does? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, of course, I can do things that can provoke their thinking. I can do things that we might in invite them into uh -huh. testing something out. So I'll be doing all sorts of different things because I don't I don't want them to just um, swim around in their own little pool of joy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to cause some ripples and maybe some waves in there so they can okay. maybe go and explore another you know body of water as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're so good at metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, so and I you know I think there's so many I don't know there's so many labels in this conversation about play and even just we can't even just just say play is it's free play or scaffolded play or guided play or play with a purpose and all those things so uh, again play responsive just sort of dropped something new into mm. the ways I was trying to to think through and the ways I try to talk about play and I thought it was um an interesting direction uh, because we the children to have to have their play uh -huh. And I think sometimes there's a risk if we're saying play based or, you know, purposeful play, play with the bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's hijacking the children's play. Mm -hmm. And I think it, in, in the end, it's autonomy that we want. Yeah. And, and children's autonomy is like the, the language of children's autonomy is play. Uh huh. So if they're not having access to enough play, they're not having access to enough autonomy. If they don't have enough autonomy, their well-being is going to be affected and they're going to try and recover that sense of well-being often by trying to find 
ways of empowering themselves and that yeah. can sometimes be by being mean to others because that makes them feel powerful mm-hmm. so in the groups where I've been working play um responsibly uh working very much with listening so that children all listen to each other so empower the children there's been none of these kind of dynamics of where you know children saying you can't come to my birthday party <laughs> those kind of things uh-huh. because they don't need to uh-huh. They don't need to exercise that kind of power because they already have enough power to feel strong in themselves and they know they can contribute and they know they can participate and they know their ideas are being listened to by yeah. adults and the other children. So they don't have to try and make themselves bigger than what they are because they already are big enough for mm-hmm. themselves at that moment. Yeah, that's interesting. It really ties in with, um, so I've got a writing project going where I've been reading a lot about and thinking a lot about play and mental health and mental well-being. Mm. And a lot of what you just described, I think, has also been in the things I've been reading about <laughs> about play's impact on, on well-being for children. Um, you talk about autonomy. I think for some people, um, and certainly at one point in my career, autonomy meant independence and doing mm. it by yourself. But I get the feeling that's not exactly what you're meaning when you say autonomy and autonomous play. So it's um, I'm talking about autonomy as a collective thing. Uh huh. Okay. (laughs) So it's it's a a way of self governance governance that you're in 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 control of yourself and your own destination, Uh but that comes with rights and responsibilities. Uh huh. Okay. So you have the right to have this autonomy and to to do things that you like, but you also have the responsibility that other people have their autonomy. Mm -hmm. And how can we work together to um, ensure that my autonomy is not uh, limited by someone else, but I am not limiting somebody else's autonomy. So this is what I'm working with, that every child's autonomy becomes a a collective responsibility, not just Uh by me, but with each other. And this is a lot of the listening things that I did and the philosophy with children uh-huh. helped with this by, by being able to listen to each other and take responsibility for each other's um, emotions, feelings to help not trigger each other, being aware of mm-hmm. if I do this, that other person will react like that. And I don't like it when they react like that. So I have to take responsibility over my actions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's yeah. there's a lot to think about. And I think people often talk about the rights of children and the right to play, but they don't talk about the responsibility. And every child has to be responsible as well for themselves uh-huh. and for others so that uh-huh. they're not um, destroying each other's kind of play frames and ways of playing. It. Yeah. It sounds, um, it sounds like, I mean, what you're describing seems to me a much more authentic way to think about children's social and emotional learning or development Mm. um you know at least here in the united states it's such a focus right now and everybody's trying to put together you know packages and curriculums Mm. at the with the aim of improving behavior essentially and sometimes Mm. improving classroom compliance but um i think it it misses the mark so often i know (laughs) i know so what i'm listening as i'm listening to you i was like oh this seems much more authentic um to achieve the same you know even if your goal is compliance a, a healthier I'd rather have consensus than compliance yes absolutely <laughs> yes me too me too I just you know I'm just thinking about how how SEL is framed sometimes um and so I like your version better up... I guess what I'm saying is I like your version better <laughs> <laughs> so what we I ended up doing was that the children got really good at making arguments um and they can make their case so uh-huh. it's not an easy thing to do but at the same time um they knew that if they could make a good argument the chances are I would change my mind uh-huh. um but if they didn't make a good argument then I would say well you know these are the reasons why this argument isn't good enough mm-hmm. uh, and it, we can't do that at the moment so they could they knew that they were always welcome to challenge my nose or, or these things that I said uh-huh. um and quite often <laughs> um they got really good at it and then the parents <laughs> parents complained ah uh, yes but not in a bad way complained they, yeah. they made a joke complaining like saying how um, good their children had become at arguing their case and and the parents did a lot of things that they hadn't really wanted to do but uh-huh. then they enjoyed because the children were right they could 
explain uh -huh. why this was the right thing to do and the parents realized that they had zero argument <laughs> yes I love the children were right I just love yeah. that I just had <laughs> idea that sometimes yeah they are um we just need to give them that chance and, uh, and the skills to be able to practice how yeah to communicate these ideas that they have mm -hmm. which which takes me back to those adults who wonder what my role is if I'm not actively leading, actively planning, actively and solely teaching, you mm. know, delivering data to them, delivering information, then what's my role? You just described really complex thinking that would require expertise and reflection and practice mm. um, and some self-awareness. And that's, um, I think you know, a, a, you, you know, for someone who's worried about losing their kind of teacher ego or their, mm -hmm. or their teacher expertise or position. No, um, I definitely had to, it, it's just a shift. Yeah. yeah. So I always had one kind of session every day where I was teaching. It, it was what I knew was my teaching part. Mm -hmm. And philosophy with children was one of my teaching moments, but basically I'm teaching by guiding their dialogue. Uh -huh. um, I would do an art session each week um, so it would be an activity quite often these activities were and more exploration so they always went into play nearly yeah. always but often there were ways to practice how to listen to each other how to be respectful of each other so every, everything was kind of feeding into each other so that play would inform me what kind of question to ask in the philosophy Mm -hmm. the um, philosophy session was giving me what kind of knowledge they had so that I could design activities that would work and a lot of the activities were giving opportunities for the children to practice the skills they needed to be able to listen to each other mm -hmm. and and this over time that because it was constantly it's messy and you know rhythmatic and everything feeds into each other it's not this nice tidy line mm -hmm. but I was constantly thinking what do the children need from me so that they can be better at playing mm -hmm. basically yeah uh, and yeah, yeah they, they need knowledge random facts <laughs> they um they need stories they need um experiences uh sensory information and inputs they need words they need to know how to listen they need to mm -hmm. how to self-regulate so there's all of these things so all of these things I would be helping them with in the activities and the lessons with the book reading and, and the talking and so yeah, yeah. I think you just made their play better. Yeah. Um. You, <laughs> again, you're you're. As I listen to you, I I just keep pulling out specific words that I want to hear you talk more about. But you just you've talked several times or mentioned several times listening. Um. And and again, I think that's something that gets misinterpreted sometimes. And when some of us are talking about children listening, we mean obeying. Yes. Uh, following a rule or something. They're not listening to me. <laughs> yes, exactly. How can I get them to listen? Um, but you're talking about a deeper kind of a mm. more of a, a two way kind of oh, yes. of listening, yes. right? Yes. Or a, or a multiple way of listening. Uh -huh. So I need to listen to the children and the children listen to me. But most important is the children listen to each other mm. because that's where we all become empowered. Um, before the children learn how to listen to each other, I have to go in and resolve and help them with so many things, which if they're listening to each other, as in genuinely listening to understand mm -hmm. what the other person is trying to say or why they're doing it, then they don't need me to come in and police them. Yeah. And, and they don't even need to police each other because they understand, okay, you did this and this is the reason and this, I didn't like it. And they can say, oh, why didn't you like, oh, because of this. And they have these little dialogues. So and it doesn't come overnight. <laughs> yes, important, yes, yeah, to mention that. It doesn't that. <laughs> come overnight. It it took, so I worked with the same children from when they were two until they left uh -huh. uh, school at the age of six. Uh-huh. And we did philosophy every week and we did all of these little exercises, but I would say the majority of our day was play. Uh-huh. I didn't teach them to learn to read and write, but when they showed an interest, they did. Uh -huh. And so I had several that could read and write before they left without ever having taught them uh -huh. just because I gave them the right impetus to carry on what they're doing. And it always kind of spreads. Once one starts, 
it starts spreading. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> so all of my children could basically write a few things before uh-huh. the status before they were required, and that's only through play. Uh huh. But and I think um, it's noticing what the children are doing. Yeah. That helps. Um, helping them to listen to each other and listen to understand. And all of our philosophy sessions started with, we listen with our eyes, with our ears, with our eyes, with our mind and our heart. Uh Because we listen to the words that have been said. We look and read the body language. Are they upset? Are they happy? How is this information? We then use our minds to think critically and creatively about uh, what that person said and how we can respond. Mm -hmm. And we listen with our heart because we always need to listen with empathy. Mm-hmm. So that we are respectful in how we are listening and how we are responding to that. And then our philosophy sessions would start with the stimulus. And then the next bit would be a thinking pause where we give a minute where the children were just completely quiet to think about what they thought about that question or that stimulus mm-hmm. and how they were going to respond. Yeah. And what the beautiful thing of that was is my children stopped saying, I don't know when I asked <laughs> And yeah. they would say, I need a thinking pause. Oh. And they all would come back with something. And I think very often we ask a question and the child doesn't have the time to process mm-hmm. what's being said, how to put that back into words, and then to say it. And I learned quickly as well, which children do I ask first? Because their answer will give guidance to other children. Because I had children who with delayed language, children mm-hmm. with other languages than Swedish. And all of this would... Um, then help them so and I wrote down everything that they were saying as well uh-huh. and so I have like one child's uh, Swedish language development completely there from when it was just sounds in the uh-huh. beginning to a uh, sounds with a couple of words to full-on sentences and then complex sentences uh-huh. towards the end her parents could read all of these every week that's amazing thinking, oh, wow <laughs> yeah yeah so you you you're talking about the the philosophy session and starting with a stimulus do you have an example of what what a stimulus might be in one of those oh we had so many different ones um so I would always have the same one at just before Christmas Uh and I would ask them what is the color of Christmas (laughs) and they would all come with their ideas of it's gold is Christmas because of this this and this uh-huh. Um, red is because of this reason and so they would all give and then someone would say well it's pink and I said why because it's my favorite color <laughs> um, so they all why have not? their reason <laughs> uh, the first year I did it when they were three uh-huh. um, all but two of the children uh, we were 10 in that group uh, or we were 13 the first year uh-huh. all but two of them said their favorite color uh-huh. they couldn't make the distinction between you know their favorite color was more important than the Christmas color uh-huh. and then, um, but in the final year so at the third year we did it they um they all said Christmassy color yeah so that you I could see how they were processing the different ways of thinking and the different connections that we're making so once we'd collected all of these colors we would then discuss okay we're going to choose two of those colors to create a Christmas painting with uh-huh. which two of these colors do we need should we choose So then they have to discuss amongst themselves (laughs) which of these colours and why those colours and and they have to come to some form of consensus. Uh And they do that. And then we would make a a Christmas painting together. Um, Often, and it would be together. So the whole idea was collaborating. Uh Uh, Often using the light table or magnetics and different experiences, sensor experiences. And then that would become their Christmas art to send home. Mm-hmm. So instead of doing something that was this is the tradition of Christmas or whatever, we we explored their own personal traditions of Christmas and mm-hmm. what was and why these colours were powerful and what they meant to them and how they connected to them and so it was a, a different way of of doing it. Mm-hmm. So I've done questions like you know are fairies real? Um, who which animal would be the leader of the forest and yeah. all these different things. So yeah, I want to have those conversations. <laughs> oh, um, and uh, robots are can oh. robots think and feel? And that came from the children's own concerns because uh-huh. of they'd seen 
we'd seen a robot they one of the rovers upon mars uh-huh. and so we were because they were learning about robots and mm-hmm. um they saw this film about the robot, the rover on Mars, and it got left there, and they were all crying <gasps> because it was so upsetting oh, that yeah. this robot would just be left at best. Uh-huh. Then we was like, oh, does a robot have a heart? So we built a robot to find out, and they still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so they told me in the philosophy session, um, if feelings, feelings, if robots have feelings, because feelings come from the heart and the brain. So they said. So uh-huh. if, a, if a robot has a heart and a brain, then it probably then he could have feelings. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's such a a good reminder of the difference between um, what Lily and Katz wrote about uh, academic skills and intellectual skills. So many group times focus on questions the teacher asks to gauge what facts the children mm. know mm. already. Oh, you know, testing, and it's testing, and this is really you talked about seeing how their thought processes are working. And um, I think that's more valuable information Mm -hmm. for ongoing work with children than whether they can get the right answer during story time or calendar time. Talking about this this last week, a calendar, Mm -hmm. Um, how I've been observing different teachers and they would ask, what day is it today? And the children would be randomly guessing days. Yes. And I'm like, (laughs) Why is the point of this? Mm-hmm. Because so many of these children are getting it wrong, and they're getting it wrong daily. Right. Um. Why not just say today's Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> just leave it like that. <laughs> They've learned it's Tuesday. They haven't yeah. been grilled and tested and got it yeah. wrong all those times. And, and the funniest thing is, uh, <laughs> when, <laughs> it's always embarrassing admitting this, but <laughs> when I was clearly too old, but um very young. Uh huh. Um, my dream job was to be the person who invented the name of the day of the week. <laughs> it hadn't dawned on me that they repeated. <laughs> and then when it dawned on me that, oh, it goes round, it's 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 a repetition, uh-huh. it's seven days. Uh-huh. I remember telling my mum, God, that's so smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my mum's look on my face, you know, on her face, looking back at me, going, what you thought what (laughs) I love that but even that is an example of deeper of deep thinking on your part rather than just memorization yeah it's so funny I love that story but I think it is like some children who have problems with their working memory learning the days of the week or the months of the year is just not an essential skill you 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 pick up your phone yeah exactly it's not an essential skill today yeah yeah I observed a, a group time a calendar time with three to five year olds and some of them were getting ready to go to kindergarten mm-hmm. shortly after this. And so they did the calendar thing where what day is it? And everybody's guessing. And finally someone randomly gets it right. Like, Yay. You know what day, <laughs> you know, they did that for the, the day and the number and the month. month. <laughs> and then they, and then they put, and it was, you know, it was April when we were doing this. Then they put, they brought out a flip chart and they put across the top of the flip chart. What do you think kindergarten will be like? And the children started yelling out month names. <laughs> it was clear <laughs> that that was their experience was like, one of these is randomly going to be right. Yeah. And and it wasn't a connection to any of the, yeah. the content. I think another the bizarre thing is this standardized seasons um thing you get. Yeah. Where, where, you know, three months of every <laughs> Of the season. weather. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I moved to Sweden. Well, in literally in England, it is three months of every season. It's that's uh-huh. exactly what it is. <laughs> and, I, and I moved to Sweden, and I was like, going, nothing. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, 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 it was uh, seven months of winter, mm-hmm. um, and then two weeks of spring. <laughs> Delightful. <laughs> and then uh, uh, a couple of months of summer, and then a couple of weeks of autumn, and then winter began again. <laughs> and then winter again. But it was different kind of gradients of winter. Uh-huh. And yeah. I thought on the chart, he kept saying it was spring. And I'm looking out and I was thinking that's snow and minus degrees. That's not spring. Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> even I, climate, you know, climate change yeah. isn't yeah. doesn't it's fit. change everything as well. Yeah. But then I yeah. discovered that the um, the indigenous people here in um, the Nordic countries, so this, in Sápmi, the Sami people, they're in Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. Uh-huh. or the current geographical areas of those uh-huh. um they have eight seasons oh 
And so there was winter and then there was winter spring and then there was spring and then there was spring <laughs> summer. So they had all of it. And I was like going, that makes sense. That's much more realistic. That, that belongs to here. That that makes sense. Uh-huh. Um, and we have the wrong kind of seasonal calendars on our preschool and school walls here in Sweden. Yeah. Because we've got colonial British ones that... <laughs> Yes. only work in britain yeah yeah <laughs> maybe certain states in the u.s <laughs> yes exactly that's right um yeah living in the the midwest of the u.s uh we get them all but not everybody does get them all with all the seasons um so oh boy this is going by so fast and so interesting um i don't think that i've asked you about the play ecosystem yet you've kind of i mean i think everything that you've talked about so far of course, probably fits it. into that, <laughs> yeah. but but you use that term, and I think that's really interesting uh, use of language. So, would you would you talk about where that comes from? How you came to that that term? As I realized that um, everything that I did was going to affect something else. You know, like if you um, if you remove the trees in the forest, it's going to affect the ecosystem in the forest. You can't, or if you put in a, a new foreign animal in there it's going to affect the entire mm-hmm. ecosystem there mm-hmm. so whether we take away or we add to um it's going to make a change to the ecosystem and it's the same with the ecosystem play ecosystem you have um the children that can be played the relationships between all of the children the relationships between the adults and the adults and the children then there's all the stuff that we have and the environment mm-hmm. that we have and if we make changes in the environment, it will make an impact on the play as well. Mm-hmm. What knowledge children have oh, will yeah. also impact the way they play. So sometimes I'm feeding in knowledge about um, dinosaurs and how they walk so they know. And suddenly you can see that the children are walking with those kind of information. Uh-huh. Or, you know, you tell tell them about that cat's fold their tongue backwards to lift them. <laughs> the dogs fold their tongue upwards, you know, that way to... So, and suddenly they're all trying to do that with their yes <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that in their play when they become whatever it is uh-huh. if you give them some little bits of information they're suddenly processing it uh-huh. uh, in their play yeah um so you know a new child will make a change to that environment uh, different furniture um the weather will also make a change <laughs> um what how big the space is mm. um uh, adult attitudes will make a change um, changing of staff will make a change sometimes yeah. it'd be for the better sometimes it'd be for the worse sometimes it's just different yeah but I, everything impacts each other so you know the more children play maybe they're going to be processing these facts that you gave and it gets that knowledge builds as well and uh, as well as what knowledge you're given is going to impact the play so it's not one direction it's going in multiple directions all the time exactly the same as it would do in the ecosystem yeah it's not just this neat little circle it's it's messier yeah and, and more dynamic yeah yeah I think one of the, the reasons that um so it took me a little bit longer than I expected to read this book and one of the reasons is there was so much just rich language for me to stop and think about specific words and why did she choose that and what does that <laughs> add and how does this change the conversation and it's one of my favorite things about uh about what you've done with the book um and play ecosystem I think can be really a powerful mm. um because I think the the words we use change the way we think which change yeah. the way we act right yeah so yeah. if we're thinking about an ecosystem we're thinking about those kinds of ripple effects and changes mm. and and responses mm. and um it, it requires us to be a little bit more curious and flexible than just yeah, assuming I, every group will be the same as long yeah. as I offer the same things <laughs> yeah yeah and I think it really is a healthy reminder that everything that we do we say our little movements uh, our small decisions how we place things everything impacts Mm-hmm. The, the play ecosystem and how the children are going to feel that they have permission to play uh, how they're going to access knowledge mm-hmm. um, how they're going to use the space all of it is we, we have so much power as the adult we are the dominant species yeah <laughs> kind of thing yeah. in that ecosystem and we can either um, make it thrive or we can make it really hard for the children to survive Uh we have to really think about our actions and our attitudes all the time yeah it's so I think 
it just adds so much depth to our work when we um when we think about things in the way that you're describing and the way that you outline in the book, you give, you give people working with children, um, freedom to go deeper or an invitation to go deeper. I don't, you know, whether they feel they have that freedom or not, I don't know, but you've, you've certainly offered them, uh, that as, as a direction to go. And I think that's really meaningful <laughs> and I appreciated it a lot. I highlighted a lot. Also, um, I, I read in the tub a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so the pages are a little wrinkly <laughs> for being like sat down on the side of the tub so I could write a note or something like that. So this is already a well, uh, well broken in book for me. Mm. Um, is there anything that you want uh, that you were hoping we'd be able to talk about or that you want to add before we wrap up? I think the most important for anyone who's wanting to kind of change the way they do things or to think more deeply is to take small sustainable yeah. steps yeah um don't I think it's um dangerous when sometimes you I've been in places where they the boss has been mm -hmm. wanting to make massive changes I've been that boss <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just not being sustainable and I think uh -huh. sometimes it's Yes, it can be frustrating for some of the um, educators who want to go at a faster space, pace, mm -hmm. but I think we need to make sure that um, everyone is coming along on this journey and that they're getting the support they need to make mm -hmm. this journey. So we're not leaving them and getting lost in the forest kind of thing, that we're, we're finding out uh, ways that, yes, maybe I could go ahead and scout the area and come back and let them know and say, this is the safe way to go, we can go this way. <laughs> Yeah. It's pretty much the same way we do with children. We, we right. find out, we find out ways and uh, to genuinely be curious about the children, to genuinely be curious about colleagues as well. Why do they think and do things the way that they do? And uh, what can I do to make that easier for them? And in, in the same way that I wanted my children to listen to each other, <laughs> uh -huh. listen yeah. to each other as, you know, like a kind of professional love between adults as well not just um Jules Page writes about professional love for the children yes, yeah so maybe we need to professional love for each other too oh that's so good yes um yeah we've talked about Jules on a couple of episodes uh with Carol Garbo and Murray coming mm. on and and talking about professional love so um uh Again, I want to tell everybody the title of the book is The Original Learning Approach, Weaving Together Playing, Learning, and Teaching in Early Childhood. But also you have a blog and and, and places that people can find yes. you online, right? Yes. So I have a blog, Interaction Imagination. Uh -huh. um, I can be found with the same name, Interaction Imagination, on Instagram. I write little daily thinkings and stuff there. Uh -huh. Yeah. And images. Um, I have a Facebook group called the original learning approach which mm -hmm. can come in and there's lots of information and blog posts and other thinkings and dialogues and uh, so yeah there's quite a bit yeah one thing that I <laughs> that I appreciate about your social media is that you're which I don't do on mine I, I post it and I run I don't come back into the comments very much but you do spend a lot of time yes. Thoughtfully yes. responding and yes. and sort of yes. and me, being part of those conversations. I think so. for me that's the most important. It's the same with when I'm working with the children. It's like if I've given them a, a provocation, I don't just leave them uh -huh. with it. It's like I have the responsibility to meet any of their responses. And I think if I'm ever posting anything uh, on social media, then I have the responsibility mm -hmm. to take care to be of part whoever of it. responds to yeah. me. Yeah. Oh, to take care of them. Yeah, that's mm. a good way of thinking about it. Well, um, I'm not very good at that. I, I need to get better at that. But um, I really appreciate that, that that's one of the things you do on your pages. So thank you again so much for being here and, and coming on and, and sharing time. I know we have a pretty big time difference between us. Um, uh, yeah, coming up to quarter to 11 <laughs> in the evening. <laughs> okay. Well, I will let you get ready for your bed then. <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. And the book has been really wonderful. And I hope everybody uh, checks it out. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. <laughs>